Good morning to everybody from Chicago. I hope everybody is safe today and uh, staying inside because of the virus. Uh, over here in the United States, it is similar situation. We are all staying very much isolated or at least trying to and make hoping that everybody else around the neighborhood, our neighbors and friends are also staying indoors. Uh, as you all know, this is a very dangerous virus and my hope and wish is that all of you are following the instructions given to you to stay indoors. I English and Hindi because your audience, Facebook audience is very wide. Uh, some people are would like it in English, some would like it in Hindi, and some would like it in English. So I am going to use English. <laughs> so uh, again, jo ye virus ki situation hai, baat serious hai. I hope aap log ghar mein rahein and safe rahein. Chaliye, let's talk about uh, Gupta Dynasty and Gupta coins. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, you know, list them in your comments or send me a message uh, and I'll be happy to address the questions. So first screen, this is about the uh, additional resources. If you want more information, then shivli.com, uh, which has got information on the book. Book has all information history on coins history from coins inscriptions all that data is in the book and additionally uh, some of the chapters are posted for free on the website academia.edu so uh moving along uh, uh sorry this uh uh just a little joke to start off uh, <laughs> uh, you know in the in the old days uh, people used to say uh hum aapko batate hain purane time mein kya hota tha <laughs> i'm thinking ke we might have to tell our grandchildren the same thing ke really ek time hota tha hum restaurants jaate the sab log ek sath baith ke khate the ab hum ab ghar mein rehte hain <laughs> so <laughs> i thought i would put this joke up there this is uh, very similar hopefully we can all get back to going to restaurants and going out and enjoying life Chali, let me tell you what this is uh going to be covering this talk uh, this is a series of talks that i hope to give to uh all my friends and people that have interest in the history of the gupta dynasty india's history and also of course uh anything to do with coins so let me tell you what this is and what this is not. This is not an academic paper or an academic discussion. This is just simply aap logo se mein baat kar raha hu, explaining to you my 30, 35 years of research, what I have learned. Uh, as some of you know, I'm also, you know, a very serious collector of gold coins and Gupta coins. So what have I learned from the collecting experience? so that some of you that are collectors will also maybe learn from it and maybe not make some of those mistakes. Um, and let's start off with a joke. Uh, <laughs> a few months back, uh, I was in the United States and I uh, got a call uh, from a uh, a uh, person that I did not know, but he was, uh, he had a question on the coin. He had got my phone number and he had me a phone kara aur bola, Sir, aap, humne suna hai, aapko coins ke baare mein bohat jankari hai. Mainne bola, haan, bataiye, Gupta coins ke baare mein bohat jankari hai. Mainne bola, yes, of course, I know. Uh, aapko, bataiye, aapko kya chahiye information. So he sent me this picture of a coin, of a Gupta coin. And he said, sir, ye bataiye, ye coin, uh, uh, ka hona chahiye? <laughs> Dekhiye, main coin ki ka value discuss nahi karta. Uh, 
आई डोंट इवन नो आप है कौन लेकिन आप अगर कोई और क्वेश्चन है आई ग्लैडली टेल यू तो ही सेड सर ये बताइए ये रियल है कि नहीं है मैंने सर ये मैं देख रहा हूं मेरे को पिक्चर से बहुत इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू से वेदर इट इज रियल और नॉट रियल बट मेरे हिसाब से ये कॉइन रियल नहीं है इट लुक्स लाइक अ कॉपी ऑफ अ रियल कॉइन दिस वन इज नॉट रियल इन माय ओपिनियन उदय सर आपको क्या मालूम है हम तो शिवली सर से बात करेंगे हमारे पास शिवली सर की बुक है अब आपको क्या मालूम आप तो कह रहे हैं नहीं है रियल कॉइन है लेकिन हम शिवली सर से बात करके बात करेंगे तो बोला ठीक है आप शिवली सर को फोन कर लीजिए उनसे पूछ लीजिए मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन सर आपके पास शिवली सर की किताब है मैंने बोला हाँ किताब तो है सर आप पढ़िए किताब फिर हम आपसे बात करेंगे ना ठीक है <laughs> मैं किताब पढ़ के आपसे बात कर लूंगा बाद में सो आई थॉट दैट वॉज रियल फनी चलिए दैट वॉज अ लिटल जोक टू बिगिन दिस टॉक सफाइस टू से मैंने किताब लिखी भी है और पढ़ी भी है तो किताब ये है दिस इज द बुक ट्रेजर ऑफ द गुप्ता एम्पायर इट टुक मी अबाउट थर्टी ईयर्स ऑफ रिसर्च थर्टी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ रिसर्च एंड अबाउट फोर फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ जस्ट सिटिंग डाउन एंड राइटिंग दिस बुक it has got a lot of information on it and it is available on amazon and a few other places chaliye so a uh, little bit about the gupta empire ye gupta empire kahan se aaya kab start hua iska sab detail book mein hai lekin just briefly aapko main batata hu ke uh, gupta empire was started originally by uh, shri gupta unko inscriptions mein श्री गुप्ता के रेफरेंस से उनको रेफर करते हैं मतलब श्री कैन बी अ टाइटल श्री कैन बी हिज नेम वी डोंट नो बट वी अस्यूम इट्स जस्ट अ टाइटल एज वी यूज श्री नाउ डेज बट इन ऑल इंस्क्रिप्शन ऑल द ब्राह्मी इंस्क्रिप्शन दैट वी सी सो फार दैट हैव कम टू लाइट the पर्सन हु स्टार्टेड दिस डायनेस्टी इज ऑलवेज रेफर टू ए श्री गुप्ता एंड हिज title that he's given uh, imperial uh, designation is maharaja he's not maharaj dhiraj raja he's not raja he's maharaja uh, after him there was uh, another uh, person uh, shri ghatotkach and he's also referred to as just a maharaja and then after shri ghatotkach we have chandragupt 1 so chandragupt 1 is we discussed him and his coinage in the first talk uh, which is also on facebook and youtube uh, and i will definitely post this also on facebook and uh, 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 youtube little later but uh, moving on chandragupt 1 is the one who really started the whole dynasty and actually uh, the initial phase of expansion of the empire from which his son samudragupt took it and took expanded the empire from samudra to samudra and basically uh, established the uh, mighty gupta empire so what we want to discuss here today is some of the coins that samudra gupt uh, issued and in the first talk i talked to you about chandragupt one how he handed over the power to samudra gupt it was a very peaceful transition um samudra gupt when he came and took over the power from chandragupt 1 his father he was a young man and his uh his uh, reign chandragupt ka jo uh, he was the uh, uh king for a long time in you know in um in the ancient times for somebody to live past 40 years of age was a big thing because of disease and uh you know the average age was not that high so for him to have ruled from 344 approximately 344 AD to 378 AD was a very long reign and during that time he basically consolidated his power throughout india one of the important points about samudragupt that we should really uh understand and appreciate is that 
he was able to really bring a lot of uh, context to the religious practices that were in India, but were not formalized. And in when I mean by formalized, I mean about uh, bringing the art and the actual designs to the different goddesses to get the gods they're written down the 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 oral traditions being written down actually and formalized this a lot of that started around the time of samudragupta and actually got formalized throughout that period that gupta the the from samudragupta chandragupta to kumargupta um we see that also shown on the coins um many years back in about um I think about 15, 10, 15 years back, I was having a discussion with uh, uh, Dr. Shalender Bhandari, and uh, we were discussing, uh, you know, the religious, uh, it was a question about religion in, uh, during the Gupta uh, period. And he made a very important point, and I want to mention that, and that is that, you know, uh, my question to him was, you know, we see that the Gupta kings uh, basically were, you know, sometimes uh, uh, promoting uh, Shaivite and Shiva based uh, 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 practices, uh, sometimes Vaishnav uh, practices, sometimes Jain references to uh, in Gupta sculptures. Sometimes we see Buddhist uh, elements showing up. And he made a very good point. He said, you know, it is uh, truly uh, a time when they were paying homage to all uh, the different uh, religious uh, deities uh, tied to the Hindu religion. They weren't, while they were all um, of the Vaishnav faith, it wasn't like, I am Vaishnav, who to aap Shaivite hai, aap Shiva ko bhakt hai, to aap hum baat nahi karenge. Aisa nahi tha. Us time, they, they built temples, they set up statues of Jain, uh, Tirtankras, they set up uh, 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 Shivite temples, they set up Vaishnav statues. So it was a all-encompassing uh, uh, homage to all these uh, different deities. And we see that on the coins. For example, let me show you a coin from uh, the earliest coins. Um, actually, it's not, uh, let's see, this to make this example really good. Let's look at a coin from uh, the Sasanian Empire, for example, uh, prior to the time when, uh, oh, I don't have it here. I'm so sorry. I thought I had the image, but I didn't. But if you look, for example, look at, uh, uh, I thought I had this slide here. I apologize. Uh, it's not here. Okay. Uh, but what I was trying to show, um, ah, right here. See this uh, crescent uh, dhwaj, the Balachandra dhwaj? This is a crescent shaped standard that is on the battle axe coin of Samudragupta. So a battle axe coin of Samudragupta, this is the battle axe right here. Huh? So if you see this uh, crescent shaped dhwaj, this crescent standard is actually a Shaivite symbol. It is not a Vaishnav symbol, but that doesn't mean that they weren't Vaishnavs. They were just showing that they they also, you know, uh, revered Shiva as a king, as a, uh, a deity, I'm sorry. And uh, if you see here, for example, on uh, the coins of uh, Aswamedha coin of uh, Samudragupta, uh, where is the Aswamedha coin of Samudragupta? Uh, right here. You see this uh, Aswamedha coin of Samudragupta, uh, you will see that uh, beautiful coin, of course, uh, one of the best coins I've seen of uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, Aswamed uh, depiction. But if you see here, you'll see that uh, there is actually a very important uh, 
element on the reverse and it is this uh, it is this uh, spear this spear is actually a what they call a maha shakti uh, or, or the great spear and this maha shakti spear i will actually bring up another image here is is uh, was supposed to have bells on it you see these bells back here that they show uh, let me actually bring up another image and i want uh, you all to know that i am having as much fun discussing this as uh, you folks some of you may be enjoying this uh, if you i'll reduce this one so you can see this one this so the first coin this one is a coin of Samudragup. And this one that I just brought up, it's another image I just took off from the book. This is a coin of Kumar Gupt. And here you can see the spear with the bells right here. This is uh, on all of the coins, the Aswameda coins. And it shows uh, uh, that they were, you know, when they were doing the Aswameda, Aswamedha, of course, as you all may know, uh, is a practice that was done by kings uh, in the ancient time. Uh, while the Alabad pillar inscription does not refer to a Aswamedha being done by Samudraga, we know uh, from the uh, 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 inscriptions we have found, uh, specifically the one from uh, Prabhavati Gupta, Chandragupta's daughter, uh, when she wrote that uh, Samudra Gupta had done Aneka Aswamedra. So it was, he had done many Aswamedhas. And we can see that by uh, the sheer number of coins, Aswamedha coins, Samudra Gupta ke bohati mile hai. Uh, uh, very large number of gold coins with the Aswamedha shown on them is uh, no, are known of Samudra Gupta. Uh, however, very few coins of Kumar Gupta's Aswamedha coins are known, which shows that, you know, Samudra Gupta, while he was during the, his expansionist period of the empire, really uh, not only did many of these Aswamedhas, but also was very, very, uh, very, very uh, involved in expanding the territories of that empire and really establishing Gupta dynasty as the powerful dynasty of Central India. Um, here is a map. It will help you better understand this. Uh, this shows you that um, where the empire and how it basically changed uh, from the extents of the empire from 4th century all the way to uh, 5th century. And you'll see uh, under uh, Samudra Gupta, he went all the way from east to west and really took over a large portion of India under his control. And then uh, over time, after Samudragup, Chandragup II, which is this area of the, uh, the Malwa, the uh, Gujarat region, Kutch region, uh, Chandragupta was able to bring this under his control also. So we, in order for this control to be done, this region to be controlled, um, the Aswamedha was a very important practice during that time. And coming back to this uh, discussion, you see here, we have the, on the, uh, obverse of these coins, let me reduce this down here. You have the Yupa right here. You have the horse, sacrificial horse standing on a pedestal. And you have chief queen shown here, right? Aswamedha Parakrama. Parakrama was the Biruda of Samudragupta, right? And then Aswamedha is the reference to this specific scene that is shown here. Uh, similarly, for a coin 
I'm strictly I'm going discussing the religious uh, things that we see on the coins. You know, uh, this is a very important coin. Actually, there are only two or three coins of this known. Uh, here on this coin, you see something that you very seldom ever see. Um, and I'll show you another coin as a reference so you will be able to understand why I am saying this is such an important coin. Um, let me bring up another coin of, uh, excuse me, let me bring up another coin of Samudra Gupta here. So, Samudra Gupta ka ek or coin mein la raha to show you. Okay. See here, you see, you very seldom ever see this line right here. You see this? This is the Yajna Pavitam. This is the sacred thread. We never see this on any coins. We actually, this, I, I don't know of any other coin in the Indian uh, coins that ever has a Yajna Pavitam shown. So we see this, we see the one mala down here. So the one mala we see on a lot of coins, but this sacred thread is shown on this coin, a very rare coin. And what's more important here is this down here, this little thing. This is actually not a haven. This is in fact a quiver in which you can see arrows. Now the Yajna Pavitam, the sacred thread, disappears from coins after Chandragupta 1. It's only during of these early coins of Chandragupta 1 that we see this Yajna Pavitam. Okay, uh, another important element. So we have, you know, the Asvamedha, we have the Yajna Pavitam seen here. We also see a very impor important uh, uh, on coins of Skandagupta. We have a another representation of the spear, this Mahashakti spear. This is seen on um, on the lead coins of Skandagupta. We see this uh, shown next to a rooster that you see here. This rooster is a representation of uh, uh, the, the whole Kartikeya uh, reference. Kartikeya, of course, was, uh, uh, there's a coin type of uh, Kumar Gupta called the Kartikeya type, which we see. And Skand Gupta was, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, a very important king in India. And we can see right here in uh, the lead coins, his, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted. I have so many messages coming on my phone. So I'm going to disregard all these messages for right now. And uh, all these questions everybody is sending in and just concentrate on my, <laughs> on my, everybody hold off on these questions till I finish the presentation. Uh, or let, next time, let's try to submit the questions in advance. It'll make it much easier for me. Okay. Uh, so this uh, lead coin, let's talk about this lead coin. This is, uh, of course, showing a Mahashakti spear right here, a rooster right here, uh, which represents uh, uh, Skandagupta's uh, uh, coin because over here it says Sri Skandagupta. And then it has a date. It says Varsha, Varsha, uh, 130, right? So 130 is 319 plus 130. It's not 130. 130 starts with Gupta era, 130, which is 449 AD. So why is this important? 449 AD, Skandagupta was issuing coins. When history books you will read say that he only came to power around 455 AD based on the Junagadh uh, rock inscription, uh, that is actually wrong. He was issuing coins as early as 449 AD. 
Um, down here, we see a gold coin, a seal of uh, uh, Skangup. But what's important here is you see that uh, if you look at the quality of this uh, design, this quality of a design is something that can only have come from an imperial mint. Uh, it is a very high quality design. So when we see in art history, when we see designs like this, which are such high quality, we can tell that these are, you know, craftsmen that were the best of their kind producing something. And of course, anytime you have a good craftsman, a high quality craftsman, it, you know, they cost a lot more to work. So you can see this is probably something that originated out of a uh, imperial mint. Um, okay, moving along, coming back to this map for a minute. We, when looking at this map, you can see that uh, initially when the Gupta Empire started right around here, around the Kannauj area, and not Patliputra as uh, history books refer to Gupta dynasty starting in Patliputra, which is wrong, started around Kannauj, which is right around here, and expanded both east, east, or this way, east, as well as left, uh, west. And then under Chandragupta, too, you know, took over this region. Um, why is this important and how do we know this? Well, of course, we know this based on inscriptions that we have found, Dalabad pillar inscriptions, different, different plates, copper plates that we have come across, different inscriptions on uh, sculptures that we have seen. But the another way we find it is by doing the analysis of the fine spots of the coins. And when we look at the fine spots of the coins, we find that even today, hundreds and hundreds of gold coins are being found. And they are generally always concentrated around two or three locations, right? So these two or three locations are basically here. These are the three locations that are the hot spots of where these coins are mostly found. Now, does it mean that it's not found here? It's not found there. It's not found there. Of course they are. But this is where majority of the coins come from. These different zones are primarily showing us that these were the areas where the highest trade was happening during the Gupta period. Why? Because when there is high trade, that is when high transactions happen, travel happens. This is where most of the, you know, uh, business is happening. So, of course, that's where we are finding most of these coins now. Why is this important? Remember, in the first talk, we talked about how when each Gupta king posted one of their either sons or brothers as the governor of Vidisha. So Vidisha is right here, right? This is Vidisha, Ujjayi, in this area. And this is the cross route, the trade routes, which crisscrosses India. They went from east to west and then north to south. And this right in the center is where it was important to control the trade routes and the center for trade, because if you were able to control this region, you basically had control of the trade throughout India. All right, moving along. So the picking, now I'm jumping from here to my first talk, which was about the evolution of goddesses. And I will bring it all together and you'll understand why I'm jumping around a little later. So we'll go back now to early 4000 BC and 4000 BC you will find that in 4000 BC we see goddesses uh, Ishtar, goddess Inanna, uh, these are Babylonian and Syrian goddesses shown standing on with their feet on lion. Now why is this important? Remember in the first talk, I talked to you and showed you how the imagery of uh, goddess Lakshmi developed during the Gupta period. The imagery of goddess Lakshmi, meaning goddess Lakshmi ka, Lakshmi uh, uh, ka jo design tha, wo kaise bana? Matlab, goddess holding a lotus, sitting on a lotus, how did that happen? Well, that happened 
during this period. You know, it started off with Goddess Lakshmi, uh, Goddess Ardaksho seated on a throne. You know, it evolved slowly into Goddess seated, seated with her feet on a lotus. Right here, she's holding a lotus. And then finally, we see this Goddess Lakshmi design. She's seated on a lotus and holding a lotus. Same way, thousands of years before Goddess Lakshmi design was finalized, 4000 BC, uh, 3000 BC, this Assyrian do uh, goddess, Babylonian goddess, Inanna, Ishtar, these, the concept of the goddess with her feet on a lion or two lions was a common representation. This continued throughout the Kush, even up to the Kushan period when goddess Nana here was shown sitting on a lion. Now, back then in India, uh, this was the first representation we had of a goddess seated on a lion that was basically uh, the precursor to the design that we saw later on come together right here as a goddess seated on a lion, but she's holding a lotus flower right here. So the Simavahani, the goddess Nana design became the Simavahani Lakshmi. And Simavahani Lakshmi, of course, then continues on to, you know, the representation uh, design going into the uh, design that we see today of Durga, similar design. Uh, so this this goddess uh, Lakshmi seated on a lion uh, came about around the fifth century AD, and it came about as a final design, basically from originating from here, from goddess Nana. Okay, which is going back to 3000 BC right here. Now, do we see uh, this, this design? Uh, do we see this design prior to that? No, we see it originate slowly, uh, slowly evolve, similar to the design that I talked about of goddess Lakshmi, where she was seated on a throne, seated holding a cornucopia, we see the same thing here. We see the goddess, you know, originally seated on a lion, but also a throne behind her. Same thing, we see the goddess seated on a lion. When the throne is gone, she's still holding a cornucopia. And then it slowly evolves into goddess seated on a lion with possibly the throne back, cornucopia, and then it evolves into this goddess seated on a lion holding a lotus. So this, the, the idea of showing you this is so you understand that the designs that we see today, which have become permanent representations of a specific deity, it took hundreds of years for it to evolve to that level. The same way, if you see uh, here, remember I was talking to you about this, uh, Bala Chandra Dhwaj. So the Bala Chandra Dhwaj is a Shaivite symbol, right? So the Shaivite symbol, even though we know that the uh, Gupta dynasty was Vaishnavite because they had the Garud as their imperial royal symbol, they're still using a crescent Dhwaj, top Dhwaj, right here. You see Chandragupta one. Samudragupta, they both issued these coins. And here we see a Bala Chandra Dhwaj. You see? Same thing here. Samudragupta shows a Bala Chandra Dhwaj. Now, the reason it is important that I show this to you is because anytime you open history books in India, it doesn't matter who's written it. Nine times out of ten, they'll talk about the fact that Vaishnav, 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 Gupta dynasty was Vaishnav. And in fact, the main kings of the Gupta dynasty were actually 
very open to all religions and fully openly proclaimed their devotion to all of these deities. There was not a differentiation between I am a Vaishnav, I am a Param Bhagwat, so I will not go and attend religious activities of a Shaivite, uh, uh, you know, temple. So this is this is very important to understand. And what we see also here is, uh, you know, this is what I was referring to the crescent Balachandra Dwaj. You see, this is a Trishul right here, but it has a crescent on top, right? So this is very important. Uh, there were different kings uh, in the Gupta dynasty, like Vanya Gupta, who openly professed himself not to be a Param Bhagavad, but to be basically a devotee of Shiva. And it was uh, very important that, uh, I'm sorry, let me correct that. He in the he not only referred to him as a devotee of Shiva, but also as a Param Bhagavat in the Nalanda seal, which is uh, which is uh, showing that he was very liberal in his views. Uh, I was actually going to go back to Skandgupt, and I got mixed up here. Skandgupt, when you see on his coins in the uh, silver coins, um, he's issuing coins with a Nandi on the back. Uh, Skandgupt, the bull type coins. In the Skandgupt uh, bull type coins, we also see another variety which has the Trishul on it. Uh, on Kumar Gupt's coins, we also have silver coins. We have a uh, silver coin with a Trishul on it. Uh, so these show us that they were very open to all of these different types of religious faiths. All right, now let's go back here and come back to our discussion on the design evolution. One second, I'm just bringing up the slide so we can look at it. Okay, so in the fourth and fifth century AD, when we see the Gupta kings start to take uh, control over most of India. What is it that we see uh, totally uh, change? We see that the Gupta kings basically blanketed uh, the currency, uh, the gold currency. It was it was the primary currency that was available there in the central India in gold. It was the only currency available. We basically mostly taking probably the Kushan coinage, melting it down to strike the gold coins, right? Okay, so one of the questions that came up was what happened to the smaller transactions? And the smaller transactions, uh, as I have mentioned before, continued to happen using the Kushan coppers. The Kushan copper coins were continued to use during that time because in central India, in this region, we do not see that much of the copper currency issued by Guptas. We primarily only see Kushan coinage, hundreds and thousands of them still being found. But in this region, which is the Gujarat and the uh, the Malwa, this whole uh, Kutch region, we see the silver and the lead coins in large quantity showing up. And reason is, in this region, the Shatrapa kings, that was their main currency. And when Chandragupta II basically started the assault over the Shatrapa region, this was where that currency being the staple currency was replaced by Chandragupta II with his currency, which was silver currency, but it looks identical to the Shatrapa coins. So basically in this region, which is right here, this region right here, the currency that was being used was primarily the silver and the lead coins issued by the 
Kshatrapas and then replaced by the Guptas and the Gupta coins here looked identical to the coins that were issued by the Kshatrapas. When I say identical, I mean they were very similar in weight and size. Design was similar. The only difference was on silver coins, instead of the three arch hills, they replaced it with the Garud to show that they, this was a Gupta issue. Of course, the inscription also changed. Some other minor elements changed, but they're very similar to it. Now, why is silver coins uh, issued here and uh, we don't have silver coins here? Well, primarily because in the old times, when a population was used to a certain specific currency, it was very difficult to get them to change to another type of currency. So if you had a population that was used to trying to do transactions for hundreds of years using Shatrapa silver coins, to try to get them to use something else would have been very difficult. It was much easier just to have the same exact coins made, same size, same weight, just with a slightly different design to say they were issued by a Gupta king now. And this is what we see basically happening here. Okay. Let me see what kind of questions are coming here. Okay. So a couple of, let me just, 